Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Kelsey Ramden, CEO of MindCare, a life sciences company using psychedelics to promote healing and improve mental health. In this episode, we discuss the psychedelic revolution, including shifts in science and culture paving the way. Kelsey explains the challenges and opportunities facing operators and investors in this space, and she talks about MindCure's efforts to build a digital therapeutic that supports psychedelic-assisted therapies. A quick reminder before we get into today's show. Every Tuesday, we send a weekly newsletter filled with insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Join other decision makers and industry operators by subscribing at insider.fit.co. Let's get into it. Hi, Kelsey. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe. It's great to be here. Yeah, I appreciate you making time. And I think a super interesting topic and company, a lot, a lot to get into. Um, but just to kick things off, can you tell us about yourself and about MyCure? Yeah, sure. So I come into this work in a kind of roundabout way that some people who come into psychedelics find themselves. So I was twice named Canada's top female entrepreneur for businesses in civil construction and real estate. So I used to build the airports that you land at and the cruise ship terminals that you uh, that you arrive at. So big infrastructure projects, that's what I did. I owned uh, companies and scaled those up in those areas. And I did what all the people do, right? Collect the gold coins, jump the hoops, arrive at the mountaintop thinking I was going to feel whole. And looked around, realized what I was looking for wasn't at the top of the mountain. I uh, had a little Buddha chuckle at myself and thought, oh, you foolish girl. And so became a patient of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy three years ago. And that's what brought me into being able to retire out of my businesses. And I didn't, you know, necessarily need to, to work anymore. And so I just decided I would come out of retirement to lead a company. And so co- co-founded MindCure because I, I see in, it's very rare in a capitalist's lifetime that we can do well and do good in equal measure. And I saw that coming together in psychedelics. And I thought, you know, there's such an opportunity in this market you know, and it's really close to my heart and it's a lot of fun yeah, to that, build something that you love, you know, you're connected to and you can do reasonably all right at. Yeah. It's, it's like I said, really interesting. I think a lot that I want to get into when it comes to both your experience and then mind care itself. So I guess sure. maybe just quickly there for someone who doesn't know, I think right now mm-hmm. it's, it's in the headlines a lot. You, you hear people from, you know, I'm sure you get this a lot of the Joe Rogans and Tim Ferriss's of the world talking about it, but also, um, Peter Thiel, who has a company and has made investments in the space. There's companies like yourself who going public, like beyond the kind of headline, like what is happening? Why is it happening now? Maybe set the stage for us a little bit. Yeah, cool. So I'm going to break this down in kind of three ways. So one's regulatory wise. So people can understand what is and is not legal because I'd hate anybody to listen to this show and go and be like, I'm starting a mushroom company and then they're all locked up. So we'll talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about, I think, culture and data a little bit. And I'm going to talk about performance. So when we talk about regulations, what's happening in Canada and the States is ketamine, uh, which is an an aesthetic drug. It is legal and people are doing ketamine infusions for depression. Some people do it for performance. So that kind of unlocked and opened the doorway. MAPS, who's doing a lot of the research you read about on the cover of the Times, et cetera, they're advancing with MDMA. And so some great research on the scientific side is coming in. And then you see decrim happening in places like California, Colorado, New Jersey, uh, advancements in Florida. So it's just, you know, it's early days of a market that it's expanding. And then the second piece was about culture. And I think that a lot of the narrative around psychedelics is behind us, you know, like the hippie, dippy area and et cetera. And to your point, Peter Thiel, like when you get investors coming into a space who understand the opportunity to generate revenue and who go to the level of diligence around the science, right? It gives it legitimacy. It's a little bit different than the first time around. And and we also have a shift in culture where people are more open to things and people are taking agency with their health and saying, I shall make a choice for myself about what's right for me. We have personalized medicine. We have quantified therapies, right? So it's just giving us an opportunity to, to, to get into it. And then the final piece is performance. And I think that most of us who've been in psychedelic world for a while understand that what these drugs, medicines, treat 
is not just depression, anxiety, PTSD, you know, it, there's actually an opportunity for a lot of folks to tune into high performance, utilizing these molecules. And you see a lot of people, you know, years ago started with microdosing and you talk about Tim and Joe, that's actually how I found the person who led my therapy was through the, those programs. And so, you know, it's been seven, eight years that people have started microdosing. Right. And folks who've been doing this stuff for a while have found performance opportunities. So it's not, you know, I think it's a spectrum. And, and that's why now is, is an opportune time, at least for Mind Cure, uh, which really we're focused on technology. So this idea of quantified medicine and personalization at scale. So if you want to do psychedelics, you want to make sure that our, our digital therapeutic is in the clinic because we measure everything and we have amazing integration tools and all that kind of thing. And then we do research. So in the lab with the, with the molecules and um, proofing concepts, uh, looking at Ibogaine and, and uh, just recently we're the first to synthesize Ibogaine. So I'm pretty excited about that. So that's what we're about, technology and science. Yeah, it's uh, if you keep up with the space, and I try to, it seems like every week maybe you guys are putting on a press release about some type of whether it's funding, investment, acquisition, research that you're doing. So it's it's crazy to watch just how quickly it's all evolving. You mentioned there, you know, you said you have personal experience with the psychedelic assisted therapy, and then talking about the various opportunities with the research and performance. Again, I, I try to pull myself away from it a little bit and say. For someone who doesn't know, what is that? Like, what even would you be selling? What is a psychedelic company selling? I know that can take lots of different forms. So I think, again, maybe just from the perspective of, you know, help us see that space from somebody who might not understand it as well. Yeah. So I'm just going to take a quick moment to do something I always think is important to do, which is to say that these medicines have been around for a real long time. And there have been researchers who've been doing the hard science for a real long time. And upon their shoulders, we stand, you know, like Rick Doblin and those folks at Max, Tim Ferriss and the work he's been doing. So that affords us all the opportunity to talk about doing these things. So I'm going to walk through what microdosing is real quick, because I think that's what a lot of people start out interested in, which is a, a sub perceptual dose of a psychedelic. That means a very small amount of, say, LSD or acid, as you probably heard about it in high school or university or college, uh, a small dose of, say, psilocybin, otherwise known as magic mushrooms. And people have different, you know, treatment regimes. I was on a four days on, three days off regime. And for me, that was like that, it gave me the that 10% extra that I didn't have to have an extra coffee. You know, it's just like a little bit of focus, a little bit of clarity. That's for me. So when people talk about microdosing, that's that's generally what they're talking about. Then when we're talking about the bigger doses and the more therapeutic experience, what we're talking about, and I'm, I'm going to talk first about what's legal, and then I'll share what's coming. Cool? So what's legal is you can find locations in the States and in Canada where you can do ketamine. You can go further afield into Costa Rica, et cetera. You can do ayahuasca, et cetera. You can go over to Europe and do psilocybin. But generally speaking, you've got a mask, like the kind that you're, you know, maybe your grandma wore as one of those sleep masks or whatever, headphones over your head. And uh, the headphones have a specific playlist going and you ingest what, what they call either a flood dose or a hero dose of these medicines. And I'll use a psilocybin example so you ingest the psilocybin generally within 30 minutes, you're going to start to feel something coming on for everyone. This journey is a little bit different, but it often looks like you're going to see, you know, shapes and colors. You're unlikely to see melting faces and the kind of things that you hear about kind of in the older media. And then generally the psychedelic experience is kind of like watching a movie. So you're able to witness something without judgment. So you can say witness a, traumatic event in your life and you're not going to take the victim role or the persecutor role. And it allows a lot of people to process things. Or you may just have a simple experience of like oneness with the universe, but what comes out the other side and, and the, so what of it all, which is like that. Yeah, that sounds great. Good time. But so what, so what is on the other side of that is integration. So that means anyone who, even if you've done regular therapy for any given reason, and you left the office, the person who was meant to help you, then you have to go and do the work. Like it's not a silver bullet. You didn't walk out like, perfect. My divorce is handled. I feel so much better now. <laughs> right. And so 
And so the same with psychedelics is you walk out and maybe you came and saw and understood something entirely differently. And you go, you know what? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to approach that in a different way. I'm ready to process that, you know, and then you get to do in the work, then you have the hard conversation, but you're so centered in yourself. And so, so kind of rooted in truth. And that's where a lot of performance, even performance athletes talk about being in like super flow states for a period of time after that, because you're so embodied and so in control. And people who do, you know, like brain work, talk about super flow states after that as well, because you're so focused. So that's kind of what that experience is like. So that's today. And then for the people who are thinking about the big, great future, you know, and you've never experienced this before and you're thinking, well, that sounds all right. I would say, number one, make sure what you're doing is legal where you're doing it. Number two, make sure who you're doing it with knows what the heck they're doing. Because there's a lot of folks who are like, right on, bud, come over. We'll drop some acid. I'll sit for you. And it's like, that's not what we're talking about. And then the third thing is this piece around if you've never done a psychedelic, like I have a very good friend, never smoked a cigarette, never had a drink, never done nothing. And I give him so much credit. It was so brave to take on this experience, having no context of an altered state of any kind. But he came out the other side of it and he was like, that was the most beautiful experience I ever had. You know, so I think it's a, it's a little bit about, you know, just being open, being taking this idea of you have agency and control. And if you have the opportunity and it, and it sounds like it's a fit, you know, stay tuned. There's some things available and, and it's about to get really interesting because the market is moving very fast, as you said. Yeah. And then when it comes time to, so there's this aspect of it that it has been around for years, right? This is not yeah. a new thing. And we're just starting to put these concepts together and go through the process of, you know, not only legalization, but also now building businesses and, and opportunities around that. At MindCure, what, what is the company doing? You mentioned the, the science kind of research and the technology, mm -hmm. those things coming uh, as we continue to evolve the space. But what are the opportunities to kind of create the businesses around that? And what even does a, a psychedelic company look like at this stage in terms of, yeah. you know, you're running this organization, uh, the CEO of this operation, what are the teams? What are the departments? Like what even is the focus on a day-to-day -day level? Great. So we have a few different companies in our industry. So I'll walk through. If anybody's listening, they're like, great, gold rush. I'm in. Okay. We have what I would call the parent companies. So these would be the drug development companies the, and the technology companies. So that'd be like us. So we're kind of at the front of the line paving the way. So that's, you know, chief scientific officers, psychiatrists, any form of scientific research who has some kind of correlation to psychotherapy, chemists, clinical research folks. Then you have a, another arm, which would be marketing, investor relations, th those kind of folks. There's a lot of that going on. With us, we have AI, we have programmers, we have, uh, I mean, a whole host of like UI, UX folks. We have biometric engineers, we have psychometric engineers. So a lot of the people who would have been working at places in the early days, of like a whoop or something, we need those. And then secondary industries, okay, now we need people who are going to be growing things. We need people who are going to be testing things. We need people who are doing the kind of like the secondary knock on things. So generally early in, in uh, these kind of businesses, you have research organizations, marketing organizations, influencers, like all the people that support kind of making a movement, right? Because that's what we're doing, we're talking about the revolution in mental health care. So anyone who's involved in, in generating movement. And then I think finally is this kind of group of the tertiary. So clubhousers, t-shirt makers, you know, the supplement people who are like, hey, we can do this other thing that looks kind of like that. And so anybody who's like really on that easy, I would I, not no startup is easy. So I shouldn't say that, but the, but the kind of like quick, quick turnaround startup that can support an industry and awareness I think there's an opportunity for those folks to make money. If you're an author, if you're a researcher, if you're a documentarian, um, there's a guy named Hamilton Morris on our team and he's a big deal in the psychedelic world. He travels the world and takes psychedelics, like those kind of things. Just imagine, and, and most psychedelic people hate to be compared to the cannabis era, but I will take the agency to take one on the chin and just say that there is some truth to that though. In the early days of cannabis, a lot of people did well by setting up kind of these secondary things. So if you're a therapist or some kind of somatic breathwork type of person, those kind of things, 
and you have the opportunity to go and get training. There's plenty of folks who are offering training, like MAPS is doing a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy training. So you can offer these trainings in your clinics. It's probably only two years away. So, you know, get set up. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. Not I was gonna ask about the comparisons to cannabis, but I think it's it's true across pretty much every industry, right? That you're gonna have these different sectors and spin outs and opportunities to uh, kind of build whatever type of business you want to and pursue that. But when it comes to the the kind of health care personal mm-hmm. well-being space more specifically, we see this a lot with digital health companies. You see it a lot yep. with supplement manufacturers. There's like, there's this line between just well-being and things that are going to make me a little bit better. And you almost, you see that with psychedelics as well. It's like microdosing, you're going to feel better. It can help with it performance. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you see this is, you know, going to be in a clinical setting, curing mm-hmm. serious mental health issues. How do you think about the distinction between those two things? And then how do you, you know, fit mind cure into, you know, that landscape to make sure you're, you're, you're being the type of company that you want to be within those values? Yeah, that's a great question, man. So this is at the very beginning days. We're finding, we're, we're sitting at around a table like all good startup founders do. And you're like, hey, who are we going to be? What's our heart and soul? What, you know, what do we stand for? And for us, it was kind of two really important parts to it. One was this stuff is not kid stuff. Like it's a difference between driving your like Toyota Tercel and a Ferrari. Like your, your joint is a Tercel you know, some psilocybin is a Ferrari because, you know, you can, the handling is so tight. Everything is so much more precision. So we decided that when you're going to be handling something of that nature, you should be doing it with a lot of care. So for us, when we talk about our digital therapeutics, we're talking about true digital therapeutics, science-backed, evidence-based, going through the FDA, like not notional, like, hey, you know, you might get a bit better rainbow smiley face actually how and when and optimizing like deep and rich AI behind it that says for Joe, what works is this. And we know it isn't this because we've measured it over a two week period and we're going to, and and that's your program. So for us, that's really important because there's lots of folks who can make beautiful pictures, but thankfully we go, you know, we did a few rounds of financing. We have a little bit of money and uh, so we can build something legit. And then on the drug side with the research, I mean, I can't share the whole story yet, but I can tell you that we decided to pick some indications that weren't what everyone else is doing. And we really want to do something that is a a little bit overlooked and is, I think, a really good pairing for psychedelics. And I'll I'll, I'll dance around that one a little bit. But, you know, I think um, I think for us, I always say to our team, you know, we want to be the organization that people trust with their minds. And that was my hurdle to come into psychedelics, right? I have one mind. Uh, It's already a little bit scrambled. I want to fix it. And I don't want to do any harm to it. And and I think that people who are listening to the show will know this because they're business people and they're, they're into wellness. Data moves the science, but story moves culture. And so it's all these stories coming out and how we do that in a way that's really respectful, rooted in the science. That's what's going to build the trust. And business moves at the speed of trust. It's just a fact. Yeah. I think that's really well put just in terms of, because a lot of times, you know, I've talked to other investors and executives who've kind of said like, you can't have a Ferrari engine with the, you know, this kind of terrible branding on the outside. Like, no, it doesn't matter if it works or if it doesn't, but at the same time, that Ferrari engine has to perform and you can apply that to so many different businesses. And I think in this sense, it is walking that line between, you know, whether it's personal well-being, performance, and then like full-blown healthcare therapy. Yeah. And God, if- sorry, to, I just want to drop in on one thing you just said there. I thought about it. I think that we're always on a spectrum, right? Even when you're like to you, your five year ago, you might have been like, "Whoa, I'll never be that guy," you know. And now you're today, you is like, "Well, I could do ten percent more." And, and I, I like this idea of like, we're never really broken. We're just like at stages of being repaired or, you know, getting better. 
And so when I think about mind cure and where we sit in that spectrum, like I'm not particularly interested in doing psychedelics for fun. There'll be a huge market around that and it will be illegal for a really long time and people will make money and that'll be rad. But I did that. I was at college. That was fun. You know, I'm more interested in this other piece. And I don't think that you have to be a performance junkie to want to understand what makes me 10% better. I think you can be just a typical person who wants to think about this idea of mental wealth. That's what I call it. So mental health is like mental wealth. How do I invest in this thing and get it going? So I don't think, I don't think it has to be on a spectrum necessarily of like, these guys are super geeked out performance guys and that's who we're serving. I think we're serving everybody who wants to have something um, legitimate. I think that's true. I think it's something that I've started to see among, you know, groups of people that I consider to be, you know, sure, high performers and they're, they want to pursue well-being kind of at the very extremes of that. Yeah. But when you take a look at some of the, the other practices they might, that they might have, you know, yoga, breath work, fasting, uh, meditation, all of these, some people use cannabis for various reasons. Some people yeah. use psychedelics. It's all of these things that at one point in time were considered really fringe, really just yeah. totally off the map yeah. and have slowly started to so much so that, you know, a lot of, of folks are, they, you know, they've decided to be sober or don't drink or don't drink nearly as much because it kind of fits into that realm. And I think in the same way that we see with a lot of technologies that, maybe start with high performers or athletes and eventually some piece of it trickles down into this general population. And if it does work and if it is clinically backed and it performs, people are going to pursue it. Uh, so I think in some cases it's, it's really just a matter of time yeah. for that to happen. And I think so too. And I think the other thing that's kind of been lacking in what we saw in the space, and, and this might be helpful for some of the people who are listening or thinking about getting into this kind of like nuanced area of, health and wellness is it so there was like you know a lot of eras of diet plans a lot of eras of workout plans a lot of eras of all these regimes and there hasn't really been an era of mental health and mental performance where you've got integrated plans so that's like it's not just about meditation or just about breath work or just about cold baths or just about fasting or just about da, da, da. it's about how does a person integrate all those practices to your point and that is like half of what we're building is this idea of how do we create that in a way where people who don't know necessarily precisely what works for them can figure that out. And it's an onboard because some people are like, yeah, that's still a little bit woo. But in the safety of their, their own home, when they do a breathwork exercise and they're like, oh my gosh, that for real, we want to bring that to people. So to your point, it's like, it starts in these far off places with people with the access. And we just want to bring that to a lot more folks. And if we were to, you know, you kind of, as your words, dance around a little bit in terms of what's specifically coming. But if we were to, you know, we're almost at the halfway point in the year, which is crazy to think about somehow it, it already is, you know, almost July, but the, the benchmarks and continuing to build both with the team and the goals sure. you had, I think it was, you know, really well put when you said, you know, if I'm going to come into this space and I already had my fun, getting people to trust us with their mind is like a huge vision that is transformative. So if we, mm -hmm. we kind of fast forward maybe the next six months, uh, cause I know how tricky it is with a startup. Six months might as well be six years. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, yeah. are there specific benchmarks or, you know, what's on the roadmap as you think about, we need to make these next six months successful and continue the progress that we've been making? Yeah, I can share that. So when I, uh, I became the CEO in December, there were five of us then. It is, you know, the middle of June and we now have 35 people. And we're probably going to, you know, see that number double again in the next six months. And the people that we're adding are a lot of, you know, for me, a, a lot of the part of this part of the scale is about execution and really dialing in on the metrics. How are we measuring success? So you can get everybody in the boat, but then you have to get everybody rowing together. So that's the next six months. And when we talk about what we're delivering in that time, like our MVP, we chose just amazing development crew to bring in house. So our MVP is going to be launched with key opinion leaders in the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy space 
in under five months time from the first code stroke, which is amazing. And then our MVP runs for six months. We're going to be onboarding um, therapists. So if people are interested in, you know, test driving the program, we're scaling up our novel molecule. So Ibogaine, we just synthesize that. And then we're working with Hamilton and doing some, doing some cool stuff in the lab. So I think for the most part, it's like, how do we make every single, even when you have a mountain of money, you should make every dollar count. So, you know, we've raised, we're publicly traded. There's a lot of visibility. And at the moment for me, like I say, it's, it's execution, timeline, being wise and, and delivering on every single promise and keeping our head down and avoiding what a lot, what, what was the demise of a lot of cannabis companies actually it was like shiny object syndrome. There's so many opportunities. It's hard to turn them down, particularly when you're an entrepreneur. And so uh, for us, it's just like laser focus and execute. Let let all the other startups do all of the amazing things in our space. And we're just going to deliver on what we promised and work with the very best partners and always like trust and integrity. That's all you ever have. So as you think about when you roll out the MVP, are you thinking of it as like a, a beta with this closed group of therapists? And are there certain outcomes that you would need to then get to, to say like, we could roll this out more broadly, or is it, you know, just a matter of bringing them onto the platform to familiarize them with it Mm -hmm. ahead of a a broader launch? Yeah, good question. So we chose some people in the space that we know have a little bit of, you know, stick handling. So they're influential among their peers. We chose people who are really well-versed in psychedelic medicine. So we want to get all their feedback, right? And we also need to get the data set up. It, you know, when you're building an AI back platform, you need data to build it up. It's like, it's like anything. So the so the closed beta, yeah, is about five months long. And then we do full commercial rollout in the first quarter of 2022. And surprisingly, well, I guess it's really not that surprising, but I'm surprised. Um, it's going outside of psychedelics right away. So there's psychedelics people who are coming to us to use it, but all these therapists. And people who are practicing these like modalities of wellness are coming and they want to be on the commercial launch, which makes sense because those people do say, you should be meditating and you should be doing this. And then people say, how do I know if I'm doing it? And how do I know if it's working? And like, it does make sense. But I suppose, um, you know, we were so laser focused at the beginning. And I think a lot of people who start companies find that. You find your niche, you focus on it, you deliver for those people. And then someone else knocks and they're like, hey. It's pretty interesting. You go, well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. That does apply to you. Um, but I'm always so afraid of scope creep and always so afraid of like, you know, you never want to overpromise and underdeliver. And you ne- there's all these things that I've learned by taking so many, you know, left hooks in my life of scaling businesses that you realize how many ways you can make mistakes that for us, again, it's just like making sure we're focused on on the goal and doing it stage wise. So we deliver something of value. Who cares about the thing I like? You know, we got to deliver something people really want. And I have lots of ideas and some of them, despite the fact that I'm the CEO and founded this baby, uh, they wind up on the floor because they're, they're not the thing that people really, really need at the moment. So that's a pro and con of being a person who lives five years ahead of the curve. <laughs> sure. And it, it might be an uninformed question on my part. So I guess, forgive me if that's the case, but you mentioned synth- synthesizing Ibogaine and mm. then having the digital therapeutic platform. Are you kind of taking the approach that you're going to deliver the drug as well as the, the software, or are you taking like kind of a drug agnostic approach where you have the software and whatever people are using, you'll have that opportunity for them to, to utilize the platform with that? Yeah, it's the latter. So good question, because it actually kind of tips a hat to uh, 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 where we're heading in the next six months is also being a distribution platform. So there's lots of folks who've developed drugs and protocols, but they don't have a way to sell that into every clinic across North America and around the world. And so we're that distribution platform. So if we're in a clinic and someone has a ketamine for X disorder thing, or on the flip side, on the platform side, where someone's like, I've built this amazing app and it flashes light at you and it, or it does binaural beats or it does whatever. And you have the science to prove that if somebody uses it on our platform, so we become a a true distribution network across all of psychedelia and psychotherapy. Yeah. It's, it's, 
you know, as you think about it, it's both balancing to your point, I guess, around staying focused and having that, that kind of precision delivering on the things that you, you, you're promising is like, there's so many opportunities and it's so early in the space that it's, it's easy to kind of get distracted with, Oh, we'll do this and we'll do that. And we'll work with these folks. And, but really getting that, you building, building the, the tr- bridges. Yeah. We're just building the bridges. You want to build the app and bring it to me. I'll have all the people to distribute it to. You want to build the protocol, like even breathwork protocols or prep protocols or anything that can help a person through their wellness journey. And you can, and you can systematize it in a way that has like a cleanse and a start and a finish. And it's got some, even if it's a, a, a robust body of real world evidence, but to your point, yeah, you know, I'm not the best at a lot of things, but I'm pretty good at building distribution networks. So that's what we're going to do. Fantastic. And, and just being mindful of time. And as we get towards the end of the conversation, I think when, again, it's discussed just at a high level, there's a lot of talk about, you know, this is transformative, certainly for personal well being and performance, yeah. like we talked about, but for mental health. This is, yeah. you know, has the, the opportunity to transform mental health. How does that play out in a way where we just go from this, you know, especially United States, North America, more broadly the world, like there, we don't have enough access to therapists. There's not enough therapists. We can't afford it. That's not taken care of by insurance. How does psychedelics just kind of break that mold or kind of repair what is broken in that? Or is it, is that too far of a leap to say that that's how it's going to play out? Yeah, I love this cuz it's it's this is the real crux of the issue, man. It's like there's a lot of people hurting. Um I think it's two things. So, yeah, we're never going to we're never going to transform it overnight. Like let's be honest. What we can do is we can reduce the total cost of ownership. So, a person like myself or like one of my very best friends who suffered from addiction for a long time costs a lot of money to keep her well. But if she does uh, a cycle of Ibogaine, she's pretty well off of what she was on in a four-day term. And so if you can reduce the total cost for a patient or like SSRI patients who are depressed and they're on these depression medications for such a long period of time. Um, So the total cost of ownership for the insurance company or the long-term disability company, whatever, gets reduced by a lot, that's going to tip the system because they're going to go, right, we can help you in six weeks instead of 16 years. I'm on the team. But but there's a whole bunch of people who aren't even covered. So when we talk about those people, what I think is so fascinating is that there have been all of these people who've been doing this work in the gray market underground for very little money with very little resources for a very long time. And I'm my great hope is that by legitimizing this science, we can unlock a lot of those therapists so they can actually put a sign out and say, Hey, I can help you. I've been doing this for 25 years, you know, and the people who, who don't have insurance have an opportunity to, uh, to pay those folks. And, and, and again, the total cost cost of ownership, it'll still be, you know, costly at the beginning, but over time, I think it gets a lot better. And, um, I'm really hopeful, you know, it is, they are transformative and, um, and and I think it's just the old thing, like the science and the and the stories will speak for themselves. Look, I'm a 44 year old mother of three children who was twice named Canada's like all this paperwork and all these things that would say that I am not a person who you know. I don't know if your listeners would be able to see when they're doing this, but half of my room looks like this. So Joe can see it's like you know the documentation that people like, and then half of my room looks like this, which is like psychedelic artistry. And, and, um, and the truth of the matter is, you know, we don't have to stigmatize it. We don't have to classify it. We don't have to say anything other than if it can be good for you, we should give you access to it. And I think the age of agency and scientific rigor is here that we can inform people and let them make their own choice. Yeah. I think you're a a really great example, kind of spokesperson for, as you just did the split screen, uh, leaning to both sides of the room there. And, and also, I think just personally, I'm somebody who came to this from the perspective of, is it overhyped? Is it, do we, uh, is it going to just be recreational? Is it going to be just purely performance-based? And coming kind of 180 from that being, 
listen, there's so many people suffering that, and we don't have a good solution. So if we did not explore this solution, then we'd be doing ourselves and everybody a disservice. So I'm not kind of like in either camp in terms of like, I'm a yeah. full blown believer. This is the future. Or like this is total nonsense. I'm just kind of in the place where, look, we need to do something and this is shown promise. So we need to pursue it to the full extent that we can. And it's really interesting to see the various approaches and companies that will be built in that space. So mm -hmm. I just appreciate you spending a few minutes today kind of explaining sure. that opportunity to us and, and shedding light on what's happening. As we wrap up and we'll actually get you out of here on this, how can folks learn more? What's the best way to connect? Follow yeah, along. Great. 100%. So a couple things. You can see us on Instagram at MindCure. You can hit me up. I'm Kelsey Ramsden. You can go all of the places that good social media is sold and uh, and use those taglines. And I would say, you know, um, if you're curious about psychedelics in general, there's just a plethora of so many great resources and books, et cetera. Like, feel free to reach out to me and I, and I can pass on all that kind of stuff. Um, I just think it was really great to have a jam with you, Joe. And thanks for having me. And uh onward we go. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.